welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining our webinar tonight, Water is Life, Don't Waste It on Fracking. Um, we're going to give a little bit of an introduction here, and then we're, gonna, we're going to go into our um, presentation, uh, which will be with our special guest here tonight and some action alerts. So um, at this point, um, can you see my uh, text that I'm showing on the slide? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, we are uh, introducing yourself in, your, in the chat, please. We'd like to know everybody who, who's here and please also say where you're from. We would appreciate that. And also um, we're recording tonight's session um, and we plan to keep it to an hour or we'll try our best to honor your time and end by 8 p.m. Uh, tonight we have presentations um, as I mentioned, of two guests, two actions, and then also we have a question and answer session where our speakers will address the questions that you have written into the Q&A box. Look at the bottom of your screen and please use the Q&A box, not the chat for your questions. It's easier for us to find all the questions if you put them there. And then after the webinar, we're gonna send a follow-up email with a link to um, this recording and also other information such as links to our action alert um, that we'll be launching tonight and our past summer webinars. Uh, the photographs you saw at the beginning will also play at the end. You and others have been submitting these great photographs over the summer for our Vacation in the Basin Photothon. You can still submit photos. As a matter of fact, we're gonna share the link in the chat because we're looking for more people to share photos. And what we're asking for is snapshots to let us know what you are fighting to protect by banning fracking and its activities here in the Delaware River watershed. And we're gonna submit all of them to the Delaware Basin Commission and the commissioners um, in order to show them what, what you think. Um, and tonight, I'm gonna to give a very brief overview of where our frack ban campaign is at, at this very moment. Then Dr. Ted Alk of Frack Tracker Alliance will speak. Then Peter D'Amico, hydrogeologist. After that, we will hear about the actions you can take now, um, and that's to achieve the full ban on fracking um, that we're all fighting for. Um, and then we're gonna have the Q&A, and that's gonna be narrated by Karen Farad, and I'll be putting the agenda in the chat too in order to remind you. Um, so briefly, uh, as most of you know, the Delaware River Basin Commission is the agency that instituted the historic ban on fracking throughout the Delaware River watershed um, that was put in place in February of this year. That came about after 10 years of our watershed community's collective work, a huge fight to keep drilling and fracking out of the Delaware River watershed when the industry came knocking at our door, starting back in about 20, 2008. The DRBC, the Delaware River Basin Commission, is made up of the governors of the four watershed states. Most of you know this, it's New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware and President Joe Biden, who was represented by the Army Corps of Engineers. And they set the policies and the regulations that govern how the watershed is managed. And they've done this since 1961. This is whom we are talking to in all of our presentations and submissions because they are the voting members of the commission who will vote on whether or not to ban it all. So, in February, the DRBC also decided to rewrite the draft gas regulations that um, had been proposed in November of 2017 with the publication date for public review by September 30th of this year. So last week, the DRBC decided to postpone the issuance of the draft regulations until November 30th of this year. So that's three months later. And that, um, that, now, that is now the due date that we're aiming at with our entire campaign. And after we see what those draft regulations say, we will kick into high gear, all of us, in the highest of gears as a watershed community. And, we're, and that will be to give public input into the draft regulations. We don't know exactly what they're going to say, but we want them to ban it all. Ban frack wastewater discharges, uh, processing, storage, and disposal here, and ban the export of water from the watershed to fuel fracking uh, outside of our basin. 
Uh, the webinars this summer, the testimonies of our frac band coalitions have all been uh, that we've been making at the DRBC meeting. Um, everything has all been uh, aimed at that goal of banning frac wastewater imports and banning water exports for fracking elsewhere. And we're going to continue this into October with a special webinar on the real life impacts of frac wastewater, where it is making its indelible impact in Pennsylvania on people, human health, and the environment. So stay tuned for an announcement of the date and time in late October. Everybody who's registered for this and our former uh, webinars this summer will get an invitation to that. So now we're gonna to turn to our speakers. Each of them have slide presentations. And the first is Ted Auk. And Dr. Ted Auk from the marvelous Frac Tracker Alliance is currently focusing on photography, uh, uh, on photographing, also on mapping and, and bringing to light data gaps associated with the waste, with the water and the land use for, footprint of unconventional oil and gas build out across the Midwest West, and also the Great Lakes region of all of North America. And he's several, uh, has se published several peer reviewed uh, papers. Uh, he's an expert who has mined the data fields of the fracking industry to uncover the facts. And that's what he's gonna share with us tonight. So we're very happy to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Ted Ock. And I'll turn it over to you, Ted, and your slides. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Tracy. Uh, oh, let me see here. Okay. Um, okay, everyone sees that okay? Yes. Okay. Let me just, so thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for kind of thinking about these topics beforehand. I, I've, I've been at Frack Tracker for eight years and I wish I was at Frack Tracker for 10 or 11 years because I would have been pounding the table on these issues uh, from the very beginning because I know how critical they are. Um, and those issues to me are three, water, waste, and gas production. Um, I think, you know, these topics have gotten a varying degrees of, of publicity and attention and research associated with them. Water obviously has been a, a, a through line throughout uh, waste in the last couple of years has obviously been a big deal. And gas production, we have no one to thank other than the industry for a pound, you know, for kind of bloviating about how gas production goes up year after year. So we know that we can count on the industry to focus and highlight gas production increases. Um, but I think it's really critical to look at the interaction between all three of these uh, over time, um, because I think that that tells a more warts and all uh, story about the oil and gas industry. And I would say that water and waste to me are critical, you know, vis-a-vis -vis DRBC and, and, and Ohio and West Virginia, where I work mostly, because those are the Achilles heel of the industry. Why? Because they can't get their head around their increasing demand for water and production of waste. And they are being aided and abetted by uh, regulators, even the Corps of Engineers, state officials, by keeping the price down for water and waste. So I think the economic supply side signal for these two things, water and waste, has allowed this industry to plot along. Otherwise, their business models would not work. So I'm gonna kind of share with you some data that we've been working on at, at, at Frack Tracker. I'm gonna, again, derive a lot of the, draw a lot from my work in Ohio and West Virginia, but there is definitely these trends, trend lines that I'm gonna talk about have persisted to varying degrees across the country as far away as Oklahoma and Colorado. So, so this is definitely, everything I'm gonna say is grounded in the data. So I, know, I want you to know that we're, we're not making this up. We've been looking at the data for quite a long time. And then I'm gonna end with my kind of way in which I synthesized all this and the way that I'm looking at the industry retrospectively and going forward and how I think it could help you all in, in your thinking about the Delaware River Basin. Uh, first, it's important to po point out as, at a, as I did at the outset that the industry is excellent at doing a couple of things. One is decoupling themselves from the complete suite of impacts that they've had on states like Ohio and Pennsylvania and West Virginia, whether it's compressor stations, injection wells, pipelines, and the other thing. The other thing they've been really good at is making sure that all we do is focus on production uh, trends and the year over year increases in that. And to me, yeah, sure, production increases have, have continued to go up at the expense of what? And in Ohio and West Virginia and Pennsylvania, it's come at the expense of watershed security and resilience and the like, and other countless environmental impacts. 
This map is from Southeast Ohio. And basically the take home of this, this map is that where gas production is high and the production decline curves are more steady and slow, that is they don't fall off a cliff, the brine production and the water usage, usage is not as dramatic. But the problem with that is that as the industry has mined the sweet spots in all of these states, they are using more and more resources to generate more, uh, you know, marginal increases in gas. Again, to just de demonstrate their viability to Wall Street and investors and the like. And this, this map just shows that, that where gas production is high, brine production and the ratio of brine to gas is, is not as high, but, but that's actually not where we're talking about today. Where we're talking about today is places that, have, that they're exploring because they just don't know what else to do. Um, the other thing to point out is that uh, energy produced versus resources consumed continues to climb by way of steeper production decline curves and more and more waste produced per well. I look at everything on a per well basis, whether it's injection wells, gas producing wells, whatever, because that to me is the way to look at it. You can generate margin, you can generate increases in gas, as I said at the outset, by any means necessary, no doubt about it. And the blue line on the bottom left figure shows the gas production in Ohio and West Virginia and Pennsylvania has definitely increased year over year. But the orange line tells a different story. The orange line tells you the gas production flatlined back in 2016 on a per well basis and is actually heading in the wrong direction. And that spread between total gas production and per well gas production has to be made up somewhere. And that is being made up by way of increasing production of waste and disposal of waste. And the disposal of waste, the lion's share of it is going coming into Ohio, unfortunately. And I'm going to get at the end of this, I'm going to talk about how I think the DRBC's decisions are connected to us in Ohio. That right hand figure shows per well, per class two well injection volume rates over time from 2010 to 2019, and then total waste. So again, gas production is falling off a cliff from the top left to the bottom right over time. Yet all the resources that they use and waste they produce is going from the bottom left to the bottom, top right at an exponential rate. We also have the issue about class two wells and were they really purpose for what, were they really designed for what they're experiencing? I'm gonna say that they weren't. The wells that we have in Ohio are older wells. The class two waste disposal wells are older wells that were not designed for the pressures and volumes that they are experiencing today. And we are seeing that manifest in countless issues with regard to brine coming up to the surface. But the other thing we have in Ohio is that our existing class two well inventory is no longer able to service the amounts of waste that they're experiencing. Enter uh, uh, permits on the order of two to three dozen per year for class two wells in Ohio because Pennsylvania and West Virginia don't seem to want to do it the way that we're doing it, unfortunately. But the point about these newer wells, injection wells, just like the newer wells that I'll talk about on the production side, is that they are designed with huge volumes and pressures, dwarfing our inventory today. So the industry is sending signals that they need and cannot control their waste production. And they need to kind of foist all of those externalities back onto Ohioans and West Virginians and Pennsylvanians and watersheds alike. The other thing, to, uh, another thing to point out specifically tailored to, the, to your, your, all, your conversation about water is that we've really stalled out in how we look at oil and gas consumption of water back in 2012 and 13 when they were using five, six, seven million gallons per water, uh, uh, million gallons per, per well. That number has gone up exponentially by the tune of like three, 300 to 500% increases in, in water consumption. And that figure on the bottom left shows that over time, water has gotten to the point where they're using 17 to 18 million gallons of water. Why? Because water is so cheap. There's no onus being put on them to recycle water. Again, the signals being sent to the fracking industry, and I would hope that it's not the signal the DRBC sends is, we're open for business and water is cheap. That's the signal they've gotten in Ohio and West Virginia. The other thing to point out is that our laterals, these, these unconventional laterals are getting longer to the tune of 15 to 21% increases per year. So the industry is drilling longer wells, and that lateral length increase is driving so much of what we're seeing. And I would imagine on the border or within the, DR, uh, the Delaware River Basin, it will similarly drive consumption needs. This, this kind of lateral length increase is driving the water consumption by, it's accounting for 86% of the water consumption. That bottom right figure shows water, shows the, the length of the, the wells, these unconventional laterals on the x-axis and on the y-axis going up and down is water consumption. 
So they're using a ton more water and it's all driven by these longer laterals that are allowing them to make up the difference that I showed you between per well production and total production. Similarly, as gas production goes up, brine production goes up. And that's the figure you see on the left. And that's for actually, that's data for Ohio and West Virginia. And that data is a little bit more sloppy. You have to do a little bit more with it. But the point is that the relationship's still pretty robust. The gas production accounts for 40% of brine production increases if you, if you plot them against each other. So gas and brine production are highly correlated. The data says that. The interaction between lateral length, water demand, and brine production is clearly evident in the data across the region. And I would imagine it would remain so if the DRBC opened up uh, the floodgates for water consumption. This has all led to the advent of what the industry touts as super laterals to Wall Street investors and institutional analysts and the like. Um, and these super laterals are, you know, we used to we we used to talk about seven to eight thousand foot laterals. Now we're talking about 16, 17, 21 thousand foot laterals in Ohio. We have several dozen. This pad right here on the bottom right, you can see this was one in Senecaville Lake in, in, in Noble County. This is actually one of those super laterals. This was gonna be 23,000 feet in length. These super laterals um, are outpacing our existing uh, seven to 12% year trend in lateral length increases. And I mentioned that for a couple of reasons. One is as these laterals get longer, they're using more resources per foot of lateral to the tune of four to five fold increases in water consumption and five to seven fold increases in sand consumption. I haven't looked at some other things, but again, these are more, the inefficiencies that the industry had, if they had any at the outset, have gone by the wayside, totally gone by the wayside. And I would also like to point out that these super laterals, a lot of the models that we've developed and others have developed do not account for this exponential increase in wells, well length. So we are not modeling these outliers, which increasingly are not outliers. Very, very scary proposition, but I also think it speaks to some of the work we've done and others have done being conservative, uh, being conservative um, in our projections. I'd also like to point out another thing that we found in the data in Ohio is that these are not your mom and pops wells, these unconventional wells. The legacy wells for all of the good and bad associated with them about finding them and plugging them and the like, they produced for the last year of data, we pulled together 283 barrels of brine per year. Meanwhile, our unconventional wells produce 8,456 uh, barrels of brine per year. So this is not your mom and pop's well. I mean, this is a total game changer for an oil and gas landscape as many of you already know, but the data backs that up. I think it's important to point out that the economics drives all of this. Um, the Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District in Southeast Ohio is a, is examples one through five of how not to do your business. They sold water to the industry for $9.25 per thousand gallons back in 2012. That went down to 625, down to 425, back up to five, whatever. But the point is, is that on a per well pad cost, these are rounding errors. So the industry is not getting any signal from anyone in Ohio or in West Virginia that they need to be better actors. As a matter of fact, they're getting the opposite signal, which is very, very scary. This demand for water going up, if the, if the cost of water remains static you know, or increases, again, the industry's models collapse. So they're doing things like what Hillcorp is doing with a community called Salem in Ohio, a city of Salem in Ohio. They're proposing untreated water usage for $1.25 to $1.55 per thousand gallons. So you can see stuff is percolating underneath the surface that shows that the industry has no idea what they're doing. And the only way that they're able to run faster and faster to and stand, it, run faster and faster just to stand still is by increasing the pressure they put on watersheds. Uh, in, our, in our case, it's uh, the Muskingum watershed in Pennsylvania. It's, you know, Lycoming and, and all the other ones, Pine Creek and the like that we've done work on. But anyway, the point is these watersheds are under siege, uh, putting it mildly. Uh, my colleague, Matt Kelso, did some really good work looking at the Lycoming Creek watershed, and I'm not going to get into his work because I'm not as familiar with it. But I think one thing that I took away from his work was this highlighted in bold section, which is that the average cost of violations in the Lycoming Creek is less than 0.05% cost of drilling. And that's assuming $8.3 million uh, for an 8,300 foot lateral. 
So again, there's no price signal being put on the industry. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite, both from a violation standpoint and from a consumption standpoint. Um, I think that it's important to look at the downstream actors and developments when you think about the DRBC or when you think about water consumption, given what I've already told you. And, and what I mean by that is, as you start to hear about the cracker plants, whether it's the Shell one in Beaver County or the, the PTTGC one in Dealey's Bottom, Ohio, or all manner of petrochemical plastics build out downstream, what does that mean? That means that obviously the people that live around there, because there's going to be pipelines feeding into them like cobwebs, and you know those are going to be the cogs that, that, that really run over people like in Beaver County. Not only is that going to happen in the immediate vicinity of this infrastructure, but upstream of this infrastructure, we can look at this infrastructure as like that, as the, the, the outflow of a, of a watershed. But in this case, it's an oil and gas industry shed. Upstream of this, at the headwaters of this system, are these wells that I'm talking about, these increasingly resource intensive wells. And to me, to my mind, when this stuff clicks in, these monsters click in, what this means for upstream infrastructure, whether it's compressor stations, gathering pipelines, injection wells, or the pads themselves, is really, really, it's, it's stunning. Um, these wells are, um, once this stuff clicks in, it's going to need a continuous flow of feedstock which means it's going to be need a continuous flow of gas, which is going to come with more resource intense, not less resource intense, uh, unconventional wells uh, writ large. Uh, so when you hear about this kind of infrastructure, no matter what basin you're looking at, no matter what region you're looking at, you have to ask yourself, is that going to be relying on shale gas from where I live? And if it is, what is the rate of growth of gas production in my region relative to some of the stuff I just talked about, that is the resource curve. Chances are these, the, the ratio of resources needed to gas produced is, is going, through, a, is going uh, you know, through the roof in your neck of the woods or adjacent to the DR, uh, Delaware River Basin. So again, this is not an industry that was in, in any way efficient at the outset and they're getting increasingly less or you know, they're getting much less so over time. So that kind of brings me to, you take all of that stuff and you kind of throw it into a framework and you ask yourself a question, what, what does this mean? How do we need to be looking at the industry? How, does, how do people, activists, scientists, journalists, that are looking at the Delaware River Basin or the Ohio River Valley need to be framing and analyzing the oil and gas sector? Are we going to just give them the, uh, give them the handout that they don't deserve and let them just kind of you know, puff their chests out about gas production? Or are we gonna to try to contextualize that gas production by trying to look at it relative to all the stuff I talked about? I would argue that we need to do the latter. We are, we are, we are um, I would implore people to do, do the latter. If we start to look at gas production relative to resources needed, basin-wide, region-wide, across sect, uh, sorry, excuse me, across companies and across basins, we are gonna see some really startling trends because I've looked at it for several states, including Pennsylvania. And over time, the resource demand curve, which I'm kind of theorizing right here, the ratio that matters is what I'm calling it. And again, I'm trying to front run what I'm hearing the resource, the industry doing, which is this whole responsibly sourced ga gas uh, nonsense that they're kind of trying to sell. We need to be looking at the industry in this way. So I guess my take home for, for this audience is that I see, it as, I see it as really simple decisions. You either decide that you are going to sell water to the industry at $30, $40 uh, per thousand gallons and, in, and increase that number as their demand and or efficiencies, uh, their demand increases and or their efficiencies decline, you know, kind of progressively increase the rate at which you charge them. That's, that's one. Or you don't sell water to them at all because they've never demonstrated and the data has never shown any signal from them or from people that sell to them that there's any interest in looking at water as anything other than a fungible commodity that, that's you know, to be traded across basins. And again, um, kind of like what Tracy was talking about, moved across basins, okay? So, so I think that's, that's the way that I look at it. I wish we had looked at it in Ohio. I wish we had developed a hard line on water pricing and looked at water 
for what it really is and the value of it, rather than, as I said, this kind of commodity that the Muskingum watershed and others have allowed it to be presented as. The other thing I'd like to say is, when you think about the D Delaware River Basin and its sale of water, you have to understand, and many, I'm sure many of you do understand, the linkages between water consumption and waste production. Okay, so you cannot tease those two out. So when you when that clicks in and water production, water consumption is allowed in the Delaware River Basin, all of a sudden, what does that mean upstream or to the west of you in places where injection wells are being permitted? It means more of them. It means more pressure on the existing ones, and it means more impacts on the people that live in and, in and around those communities. So there's no way to decouple all of these myriad impacts. Uh, and I, to my mind, you know, the whole, this whole thing reeks of, you know, kind of corporate welfare. And to me, one of the, the major drivers of it is cheap water and cheap waste. And I think that the data says that. And I also think that going forward, it's going to be better. It's going to, we need to look more holistically at gas production because underneath the surface is some really nasty trend lines. And I think the data that we've collected shows that. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll kind of, I came in under time, I think. So I'm, I'm happy about that. So I'll uh, yield the floor to Tracy and or Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's, that, that's great. You only ended one minute early. That gives us one more minute for Q&A. So thank you very much, Ted. Um, next, we're going to hear from Peter D'Amico. And Peter D'Amico um, is here with us tonight. He's, he lives in the southern part of Pennsylvania. He's a professional geologist, and he's an expert in the science of hydrogeology. He performs water resource evaluations, aquifer testing, groundwater flow modeling, fractured groundwater, uh, fractured rock groundwater flow studies, and also groundwater geochemistry analysis. So he's a real scientist here, but he also has his feet on the ground. He's a true geologist. Um, he's a former mayor, for instance, and, and has worked for many years in the townships that, that he lived in in New Jersey. And he's received awards and other recognitions during his 36 years in the field. So um, we're lucky to have Peter with us tonight. And thank you, Peter, go right ahead. Um, I'm going to be showing your slides for you. So I'll get that slideshow up and um, we'll go from there. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction. That was quite an introduction actually. But um, yes, I'm gonna change topics a little bit about water and water resources and basically, um, what is happening as far as I can see, A, with water resources and the development of water resources locally. And then we're gonna take a little trip out of the area and we're gonna talk a little bit about CO2 in the atmosphere and what it seems to be doing. I know there's a lot of controversy there, but I'm gonna try to focus in on what seems to be happening and where we seem to be going from there. So if we go to the, this first slide is actually the first slide was kind of interesting because it is the, uh, um, uh, it's one of the, I forget if it's the vernal or the autumnal equinox. The sunlight is almost due north south because the planet is in line with and parallel to the, the plane of the, the sun at that point. So here is, um, I don't know if you can see all my uh, comments on the, on the right or not, or if it's being blocked yeah, we by, can see them. Yep. you can see them. And the typical hydrologic cycle, and we have, you know, rainfall, precipitation, transpir transpiration, evapotranspiration, and all those um, nice movements to generate the water around the planet. Question is, what is the only thing in this cycle that we really haven't altered, or at least we haven't tried to alter yet. And I think the, the appropriate answer is the sun's heat. I don't think we've, we've managed to alter any of that yet. But um, as we will see, the sun does have its own cycles and the earth's rotation has its own cycles that impact on, on heat and heat control. Uh, so let's, I mean, that's, 
hydrologicycle is fairly straightforward. We, I think most of us have seen or talked about it at some point. Uh, let's go to our next slide. And the other point to notice is that the DRB special protection water area, which is an area designed to maintain and or improve water quality is really the closest area to potential fracking in other um, areas that might want to export water or maybe even import water just from a logistic standpoint because it's close. And what water resources do we have in this area? Well, we have reservoirs. And some of those reservoirs are critical drinking water reservoirs and drought management reservoirs if stream flows get low. We have rivers that require their aquatic, uh, aquatic requirements with their low flow. And we have groundwater, which in this area is almost all from fracture rock. And typically groundwater in this area is limited for only small scale development, mostly I would say for a highest quality of use for drinking water. And it's, it's limited in this area. There are a few exceptions where you have limestones where you can get higher production wells, but that's a few and far between. And it should be noted that in most of the Northeast or the states that I work at, New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, the first thing you have to do when you're trying to allocate water resources is justify the need. If you cannot justify the need, you're not going to get your allocation request. So when we go in for a water allocation permit, we have to justify the need for the water. And at this point, I don't think justifying the water for export to fracking is, is going to hold much weight. We have too many other competing resources uh, for this water. So that is one of the regulatory impacts. Now here is um, some data local to myself, White Clay Creek. Uh, it's where I take my doggy for a walk all the time. And the mean discharge, this is just mean monthly discharge plotted going back to the 1930s on to current times. And in that you can see, just put a simple trend surface analysis. What is the linear trend going on in that data? And as you can see, it, it's going up. And towards the latter part of the um, graph, later years, you can see that the peak monthly discharges have gone up significantly. But there's another line on that graph down at the bottom. And that line on the bottom is basically the low flow uh, part of the graph, the low flow years and the low flow months. And as you can see, they're not changing all that much. Uh, we still go down to those low base flows, even with the accelerated rainfall and uh, larger uh, mean discharges we see. And what is the cause of that? Well, the rainfall comes in faster doses at quicker times and runs off. It's still not helping out essentially with the groundwater resources, which is what the base flow shows. And the drought of the 60s also shows up nicely on that graph if you look carefully, 63, 64, 65. Um, that was an interesting perturbation in this, this whole cycle, but it's pretty clear to see that one. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Oh, well, what's wrong with this picture? Um, when you look at it from a hydrogeology standpoint, just about everything. The soil in that nice grass has been mowed and mowed again and packed. You get large amounts of runoff. It's almost like I call it uh, suburban, um, suburban impervious cover. Because when you do a standard penetration test, and you do one in that soil, then go over to that fence line that's not mowed and right under the fence line, it's completely different. Um, so there's little or no infiltration on these lawns. Uh, there's no bio, biodiversity and being a, a amateur or whatever beekeeper, um, that is not good for the bees. There's just nothing there. It's a very sterile environment. It, 
looks nice, but it's not what we need in the way of managing our water resources. And the other, one of my other little keys is that we spend a lot of gasoline mowing lawns. Um, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Maybe we should be doing some additional work on taking care of those as um, managed um, meadows and, and natural grass fields. Uh, I don't know what our neighbors would think of that if I did that, but I'm very tempted to do that. Um, and if you're ever in and visiting Longwood Gardens, make sure you go out and look at their uh, their meadow area where they keep the meadows and what a difference it looks between the meadows and the, and the grasslands. And just the difference is, is interesting just to look at. You see the diversity of the plants, you see the birds eating the seeds from the flowers and you know all those good things are out there. The bees are out there versus that sterile landscape lawn that, that you have to use oil to and more carbon dioxide to take care of. Um, not particularly a, a uh, good idea. So anyways, what is going on with uh, that river chart we saw? There's more runoff, there's more rainfall at times. Well, you look at the global surface temperature and then you see from approximately uh, 1 AD coming forward into the 1500s and then 1850, the start of the Industrial Revolution. And then the basically it takes off, it's going up exponentially. And the last four, five years, I think now in a row have been five of the warmest ever. Well, there's gotta be a reason for that. Certainly looks like carbon dioxide and probably methane are there as major drivers. And you look at the, um, on the other graph, the lower part of that graph is where we probably would be without any impact. And see, there's actually a small decline in potential trends naturally. And that is um, from this solar orbit things I'm gonna to touch on briefly, even not spend too much time on. What's happening there is there's almost would be a very small, minute uh, cooling trend. And back in the uh, early days when I was um, at school, we were thinking, well, we have these global uh, solar perturbations that might be cooling the climate. Maybe we're gonna go back into an ice age. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And as you can see from this slide, we have gone from warm interglacials to the glacial periods fairly regularly on about a 100,000 year cycle, give or take. And the last interglacial was actually a pretty warm one. Um, perhaps sea levels were a few meters higher than they were today. If you do a lot of geology in Southern Delaware, there are a couple of formations down there that sit on the top of the uh, uh, older formations in coastal Delaware and most of Sussex County that are from high sea level stands from previous interglacials, where the water level was a few meters higher than it is today. So it has gone up that high. Sussex County is you know, underlying and to some lesser degree, Kent County and some of the areas along the Delaware Bay and uh, Newcastle are also uh, have these later interglacials in them. But one of the uh, other interesting things about that is the, inner, the glacial cycles seem to be getting a little bit deeper and colder with time. So let's look at some of the um, glacial information. And this information, if you look on the right, is from oxygen isotopes, which uh, are um, some of the main drivers of looking at temperatures in historically. And there's also direct information available from ice cores that go back about 800,000 years. But before that, you're using different uh, proxies. There's no direct measurements. But I, one of the um, takeaways from this is the different cycles. You have uh, warm cycles, 
and coal cycles in the glacial period. And they're quite pronounced uh, on perhaps decades to century type timescales where they're bouncing up and down. And then you come into the last 10,000, 12,000 years. I should mention the upper one is from uh, Greenland and the lower one is from Antarctica. And sometimes when Antarctica warms, we the Northern hemisphere colds and vice gets colder and vice versa, which is an interesting um, uh, concept we'll talk about. But look at the last 10, 12,000 years, it's been very stable. And that's kind of scary. It's not the norm to be stable like this. Uh, climate perturbations are typically much more um, variable and rapid. I guess we should either consider ourselves lucky or uh, maybe we've just been lulled into complacency. I'm not sure which, but um, that's what the last 60, 70,000 years looks like uh, as far as climate. So what controls the show without humans? Uh, a lot of this was in back when I was actually in school, which is now a long time ago, we talked about Milankovitch cycles, which was the climate precession, the precession of the equinoxes. In other words, the wobble of the earth's tilt, it changes over a 26,000 year period. And that orbital precession is, well, if you listen to the, you know, the age of Aquarius we are recently going into, that's because the sun now rises in the constellation of Aquarius in uh, the uh, vernal equinox. Uh, previously, it was, I believe it was Pisces. It's, and before that, it was, um, oh, I can't remember, but that's not important. Basically, the precession of the equinoxes controls the tilt of the Northern hemisphere towards the sun at different times of the year. Sometimes it's greater, sometimes it's less. Um, orbital obliquity, the, uh, our orbit is not always, it shouldn't be considered circular, but our orbit does vary from near circular to uh, some rather oblique time periods. And then there's also the orbital eccentricity, which is the tilt of the axis. Not only does the axis change its uh, point in precession where it's pointing to the North Star and then 26, no, 12,000 years later, it's pointing to Vega um, as the North Star, but the orbital eccentricity or the axial tilt changes. And there's been some news in that saying that extreme amounts of water resource depletion have actually maybe affected that, but not enough. But when you put all those three together, you get cycles on cycles on cycles. And we thought when we looked at them that we were going to be chilling down, which is what I described before, you know, getting slightly bolder over time. Uh, a lot of this has been discredited to some degree, but there's even more cycles on top, that, on top of that. You have the sun cycle, sunset cycle every 11 years and that also has changes in the amount of uh, energy we're receiving from the sun. And then you have cycles in the 12 years, 11 year cycles, where there are some years where there are abs absolutely almost, some cycles where there's absolutely no, almost no um, sun solar sunspot activity. So that also changes uh, the amount of solar energy coming to the planet. So these things are all part and parcel of that. And then you have the human CO2 and methane and sulfur dioxide and other components going into the atmosphere. Actually, some of those components, sulfur dioxide, will actually act as a counter to methane and CO2 and tend to lower things. There are um, a, some interesting articles on what the different um, chemicals will do to the uh, heat retention in the atmosphere. Well, what this boils down to is uh, ocean currents and ocean currents redistributing heat on the planet. And this is the you know, picture of the Atlantic uh, overturned meridian circulation where warm water comes from the um, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico and even from the South, 
South Atlantic up and redistributes heat up into the northern atmosphere, northern part, especially northern Europe and up into that uh, northern, keeping that area warm. And that current has a 20 year cycle. And that current currently is, uh, was on a faster cycle in the previous 20 years it was on a slower cycle. It, actually, the amount of water flowing up into the Arctic decreased over time. Now it increased, and now it seems to be decreasing again. And you'll see articles on that saying, what's happening with that? Well, that's part of a 20-year cycle that's probably natural, but we're impacting it. So what we see is that historically, going back even into the uh, early Eocene, mid Pliocene, carbon dioxide levels have been dropping and dropping. And then sometimes they will um, bounce up and down. And there's a lot of drivers to all of this. So that's where the complexity comes in and it's how to predict the future. But right now we have carbon dioxide levels that are uh, approaching mid Pliocene warm period carbon dioxide levels, which is near and dear to my heart because that was my thesis area in central Delaware. And I was studying that. And uh, as very young energetic scientists that I was, we found foraminiferae and ostracods of near surface, near marine shore origin into estuarine origins of 60 feet mean sea level Delaware. Uh, Sandtown landfill, if anyone's familiar with Delaware. And that's only 3 million years ago at the carbon dioxide levels we're at now. They called it the mid Pliocene warm period. So, and that, that should raise your eyebrows. And if you look at projections, which are uh, shown in the upper part of that top graph, those SPC projections are from a uh, article I will show you the reference to later. It's kind of funny, they say it's still a draft and they don't say reference it, but too bad I went ahead and did it anyways. Um, thank you, Peter, and thank you, okay. Ted. We greatly appreciate both of your presentations. I'm gonna turn it over to Karen now, and she's going to be talking um, about our next uh, items on the agenda, Karen. Hey, thanks so much, Tracy. Actually, we're gonna to get to Q&A <laughs> in just a minute. Um, but first, we have a couple of actions we'd like you to take. And to talk about the first one, I'm going to pass it over to Eric Weltman from Food and Water Watch. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Weltman, and I'm a Brooklyn-based senior organizer with Food and Water Watch. I have a special call to action for my fellow New Yorkers. In a moment, I'm going to share a phone number. So please get your pens ready. We have a new governor. Woo! Kathy Hochul. She's a bit undefined when it comes to a lot of issues, including uh, climate change and the environment which is why we need to flood her office with calls this week, urging her to support a complete ban on fracking in the Delaware River Basin. So here's the number to call, Governor Hochul, 877-235-6537. I'll put it in the chat, but here it is again, 877-235-6537. Please call early and often this week. You can even leave a message tonight after the webinar. Again, please call this special hotline to Governor Hochul's office this, this week. And please spread the word and invite others to do so. And of course, if you're not a New Yorker, please share this call to action with those you know who are. Again, Governor Hochul at 877-235-6537. Three seven. Call early and often this week. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Eric. And you know we have another action to tell you about, and it's for everybody. Um, and this is one that you're going to see a link to in the chat. You know we've been talking about wastewater and the importing of it on a lot of the webinars that we've done to date. And tonight we're talking about the other regulation that they're talking about, which is the one that would, of course, allow our water to be removed and go and frack up other communities. And so it's really important that the that the uh, commissioners hear from us on both issues because 
you know, nothing's written in stone at this point. We don't know what's going to happen. And it's entirely possible that they'll say yes to one regulation and no to the other. And so they need to hear from us on every aspect of this. And so the action tonight speaks directly to the, um, the exporting of the water from the river basin. Um, and so we are asking you to go to Action Network where a letter has been prepared. You can just go there and Tracy's putting up a screen about it now. You can use the bit.ly link to go there and you can um, uh, read the, uh, you know, the brief uh, introduction to what the letter is all about, but then click on start writing after you've filled in your information. And it's going to give you a letter that you can just send as is, but we always encourage you to either write your own comment because you have strong opinions about this, or at least customize the letter that's already in the Action Network form. Uh, because it's really important when they get these things that they don't just say, oh, here's another one that looks just like the last one. Customize it, put in your own thoughts. Uh, and so it's very, very important, again, that they hear from all of us. Now that we have all this extra time until November 30th, it's really critical that we keep the sustained pressure going. But the other thing that's important to um, think about is the webinar that's coming up. And as Tracy said at the beginning, because we have this extension now to keep organizing, uh, you know, we thought it was important to bring to you some of the real life stories of people who have been so profoundly effect affected by wastewater um, and what fracking has done to their communities so that we know that you know, it's that much more important to not let these regulations pass. We need to ban it all, get the full ban uh, that we want on all of these fracking activities so that our communities are protected and so that nobody is affected adversely by fracking waste and any of it. So anyway, look out for the announcement for the upcoming uh, webinar that we are just going to be uh, announcing in the next few days, I imagine. Uh, and uh, and please, please, please attend and please use that link that Tracy just put into the chat to send your message to the commissioners who need to hear from you. All right, so with that, I don't want to take up any more time because we do have some questions I want to get to quickly. Uh, let me go to, um, uh, I guess this one, first one is for Ted, and it's a really good question because uh, it has to do with the transport of water and you did talk about trucks in your presentation. So uh, maybe, uh, you know, you could address what we can expect uh, should they try to allow, uh, you know, all of this water to be moving about. Um, where does, how does the water get there? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I was looking at it. Um, it, it let me just say quickly that uh, I, I've been looking through a lot of the filings of these companies, the publicly traded companies uh, with Intero being one of them. Uh, and Intero revealed last year in their SEC filings, Securities and Exchange Commission filings, that their water pipeline network amounted to something like 65% of their gathering pipeline network. So what does that mean? That means that they had, they had, they had mileage of pi water pipelines that equaled 65% of the pipelines they had for their gas just to move their gas around. So the pipeline network is something, and we've done a lot of work mapping gathering pipelines in Pe Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, and we're finishing up a paper on that. But it's totally making me rethink the scale and scope of this pipeline, the water pipeline. So yes, it will have to be piped and it will be trucked. Um, and I wanted to say one thing about that too, which I think is the devil is in the details with that, because when you think about what you're hearing about in DRBC, when we looked in Ohio at all the water used and the water withdrawn, we saw that the amount of water used, or sorry, the amount of water withdrawn that we could document in Ohio only accounted for 85% of the water used. So somewhere in there, there's 15% of the water used by the industry. We're talking about millions, maybe billions of gallons of water is totally undocumented. So when you think about water coming out of the DRBC, you're thinking about the known and the known unknown water that's going to be coming out of there. Because I guarantee if they're going to be hauling out water that they're going to document, you're damn sure they're going to be hauling out some stuff from a creek every now and then to fill up their, you know, their things. So, so yeah, it's going to be trucks and it's going to be pipelines. And I think the scale of pipeline build out is something we really don't understand. But I think if the filings of that company are any indicator, it's, it's pretty significant. Thanks, Ted. And I think the next one is also for you. Um, how much water is lost? from surface of earth at a well due to remaining in the well after stimulation. Right, yeah, I saw that too. So uh, I haven't looked at that data in in several years and and this, this question is prompting me to think that I need to go back and look at it, uh, Mark, because we did look at the data for what goes in and what comes out on a per well basis. 
Um, and, you know, I, I don't even think that I, I can't remember the figures offhand for Ohio and West Virginia. But the point is, is that uh, a kind of non-trivial amount of that water never comes back up. Um, you know, it's 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 a significant amount that never comes back up. So your your the answer to your question is is we need to revisit the data. But the first pass we took at it showed that it's a major major issue. Um, you know, lost for good. Yeah, I would just add that um, I have looked at those numbers uh, over the last year, um, and they began saying in Pennsylvania that it was about um, eight to ten percent that came mm -hmm. back up and mm -hmm. all the rest stayed underground. Mm -hmm. And over time, that seems to be proven true. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about is locking away 90% of the water that's injected. And you only take a little bit, basically, back to the surface and that then they call, they recycle it, they, they call it. But it's basically, they frack another well with it. So it, the point is that a lot of the water is lost completely to the hydrologic cycle, which is very weird. There's very few actions that humans take that do that kind of a total loss, a total depletion of water. Um, and then where what does come back up is contaminated. It will never get back its original chemistry. It will never get back its original quality. So we're really talking about a complete loss, like you said, Ted, of the water, either by being left underground or by being contaminated beyond renovation. Thanks, Tracy. Actually, we have a little bit of time um, left, I hope, because we're over time by a minute, but maybe we have time for one more question. It's for Peter. It's one that came in in advance of this uh, webinar tonight. Uh, and Because I, I think it's a really important talking point for all of us who are going after the commissioners with our comments. Uh, and that is, uh, you hear from the industry that, oh, all this rain is creating all of this water, so wouldn't it be beneficial to remove some of it um, so that we, you know, taking it out of the water shed isn't really a bad thing at all. So do you have like a very short talking point for us to use when we go after our commissioners? Well, when you're talking about water resources and they're pulling out any type of water almost at any point, you're going to impact the uh, baseline, base flow of that stream, unless you're doing um, what's typically called uh, uh, storm skimming, which isn't, in my idea, a good idea, because you're taking very dirty water and trying to do something with it. But most of the other water that you deal with, um, when you pull it from the system, you're going to impact part of the hydrologic cycle, usually the stream base flow. And the stream base flow is there to maintain aquatic life in the stream. So it's, it's you know, a critical component of what you're uh, trying to protect. So you, you really cannot remove that water and not have it return in some way, shape or form, uh, which is what the fracking does. It just takes it and removes it from the system. Thanks so much. I hope, and we're, I hope that answered the question well it, enough. But. It does. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're at 8.03 and to be respectful of everyone's time because we did run over the hour a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to close it um, for the evening and I do apologize to those whose questions did not get answered. But uh, once again, just remember and now we have until November 30th to keep the pressure on our commissioners and therefore, you know, please do the action alert that Eric talked about. If you're in New York, uh, call the new governor. And if you're here in Pennsylvania, do the action alert that Tracy's been sharing in the chat. Look for the announcement for our upcoming webinar that will close out our uh, series, our summer now turning into fall series. And uh, with that, uh, again, thank you all so much for being here tonight and look for emails with links and all of that good stuff uh, that you can use to move forward and learn more about everybody you heard tonight and learn everything about how to get to those important actions. All right, thank you very much, everyone.